We acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is recorded. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and to Aboriginal elders emerging. Please be advised this podcast contains content of a graphic, violent nature. It's not appropriate for children. So I dropped you off at school and I'd always said to Natalie, you'll ring me, you know, if you want to lift home. Anyway, there was no call, so I just presumed that she'd gone into Frankston, which she often did. And anyway, when the bus came, quarter past six, Natalie wasn't on it. I was a bit concerned about that. The next bus came, a little after seven, and when she wasn't on that, I said, Brian, oh, oh, something's wrong. And I said, oh, um, is it a female? And they said, yes. And I said, um... School clothes on? They said yes. I said, John Paul College school clothes? They said, hmm. I said, well, it's not Natalie because I said, Natalie was too strong. She wouldn't let anyone hurt her or kill her. That's Carmen Russell, whose daughter Natalie became the third victim of Frankston serial killer Paul Charles Denyer in 1993. She was 17 years old. Later in this episode, you'll hear chilling audio of Dania reenacting that crime for police. This is Australian True Crime with Michelle Laurie and Emily Webb. Come with us as we discover how people become killers, how people become victims, and what happens next. Michelle and I are a bit awestruck by our guest Charlie Bazina. Charlie is a former head of Victoria Police's Homicide Squad and has been involved in some of the biggest murder cases in Australia. We know from your feedback that you really wanted to hear more from Charlie, and we did too. So here he is taking us behind the scenes of the case known as the Frankston serial killings that happened in 1993, where Paul Denyer stalked and murdered three young women, Elizabeth Stevens, who was 18, Debbie Freem, 22, and Natalie Russell, 17. We started by asking Charlie exactly how the investigation came across his desk. It was on the 11th of June, 1993. You get a call late at night that uh, a, uh, a body of a uh, young female had been found at Lloyd Park in near Cranbourne, just out of Frankston. Uh, so, like any other homicide, we turn out to it. It was a horrible da- a day, it was um, or evening. It would have been raining cats and dogs, which is not conducive. The fact that I knew there was a body out in the open, right. that the crime scene's going to be v- yielding very, very little. So we go out there not knowing a thing, and that's where we start the investigation. You start at the crime scene, the crime scene tells you a story. So we get out there, here's the body of a young female uh, wearing slacks, her top's been pulled up, um, significant um, uh, cuts to her throat. Um, so you start thinking about, is this a sex offence? Is this uh, something that's happened? Or what, what is it, a domestic? So you start building the case from that body. That's where you start. Um, so uh, we, we identify the young lass as uh, 18-year-old Elizabeth Stevens. Now, Elizabeth uh, was up uh, living with her uncle and auntie uh, not so far away and uh, going to the Frankston University. So your first thing is you try and backstep where the victim had been prior to it. She left a note for her uh, uncle and auntie to say, look, I'm going to the Frankston Library, uh, I'm going to do some study, then I'll be home later on. And you start, everyone becomes a person of interest. We won't word, use the word suspect. Sus- everyone's a suspect. Everyone's a person of interest until t- you can eliminate them. Mm. The person who found the body was a person walking a dog or collecting some cones for, a, um, for um, a fire or something. So we eliminate that person. Then we've got to start eliminating the uncle and auntie she was living with. And then you go on, the, her social groups, her, her sporting groups and so forth. So we started building up this picture. We found out that Elizabeth was very naive, 18-year-old, up from Tasmania. And we then had to then go start at the uh, library to see tr- Backtracker. So we, 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 uh, we knew that uh, from her family that she didn't have a boyfriend. So you, you, you start minds going, has she been stalked? Did she have a boyfriend we did not know about, we being the family? Um, you know, what's happened here? How did she get on? How did she travel down there? We knew she travelled by bus and travelled home by bus. So we try and re-step 
uh, her, her steps leading up to her demise. How did she get to this park? Was she driven here? Did she meet someone? And again, it becomes important to us. So you process the crime scene, and the crime scene yielded very little in relation to footprints, any uh, physical evidence. Her bag was there, um, and that's all it really was. And, and interestingly with Lisbeth, we found her torso uh, had been cut with a, like a tic-tac-toe, very into her skin. Mm-hmm. So you start thinking out loud and saying, well, geez, is, is this something satanic in relation to her? Because it wasn't a deep cuts into the chest. We were satisfied it wasn't, uh, once we got the, the body back to Melbourne for the post-mortem, it wasn't sexually motivated. The top was pulled up because we surmised from, again, the crime scene telling you a story that the body had been dragged by the legs, which in turn pulled the top up okay. and the bra was uh, showing. It was significant injury to the neck. So we knew we were looking for a sharp instrument. No blood trails, I imagine. It was pouring down with rain, mm. muddy and the like. So where do you start? So we started the conversation, of course, then going to the family. She'd been reported missing by the uncle and auntie. So that's our first port of call because she had no identification on her. And then we start looking. Missing persons, okay. She's been reported just recently in that area. One thing led to another. We identified her. Then the next step comes is the post-mortem. Crime scene tells you a story. Then the post-mortem. People say to me often, Charlie, why do you guys go to the autopsy, the post-mortems? Because we're the investigators. Mm. We've got very highly skilled pathologists in Victoria. We're very lucky to have them. They're all basically come from, uh, a lot of them come from uh, England. They've all got law degrees, um, but very, very astute people. So we can go to the post-mortem. We get gowned up. We're in the post-mortem room and we're directing things of what we want them. So can you, and there's a process. A normal post-mortem takes at least four or five hours. Wow. And they're, and they're taking specifics. And it's straight when we leave the body, we escort the body back and we start um, doing the post-mortem because we want to see what evidence that yields. Mm. So we then find out, okay, it was a significant uh, injury to the neck. Um, we, we satisfy ourselves it wasn't a sexual offence because of the clothing the way they were. Yet all swabs are taken. Uh, of the body because we, we need to have that link. It's what they call a nexus. We have to build a link. We've got to put the offender at that crime scene. Had no idea this was a, a perfectly legitimate young girl, young girl, young lady, um, that was going about a normal business. First thing I asked myself, why would someone want to kill this person? Mm. What There's always a link. Often there's a link between the offender and the deceased. Mm. And we found nothing of that. It's most often someone you know, right? Exactly. Yeah. Most often. And they're the easy ones. Yeah. So this was just a, a uh, many, one of the many typical homicides that I've investigated over the 17 years, having been at the squad. And you go about your business and uh, you, know, you sit with a family and you get the family alibi where they were. We start making inquiries at the library. Had she been followed at stalk? So we couldn't put her at the library. We, couldn't, we rode the bus. We did a mannequin with mm-hmm. um, Elizabeth Stevens and the clothes and that type of thing. Rode the buses for the whole shift of an evening to see, did anyone see this lady? Did anyone mm. see? Nobody. And it's just amazing that, you know, in broad daylight, no one takes any notice of anything. You go mm. about your business, head down, yeah. and just move on w- with your next step. So we, we couldn't put her there. Now, has she had a boyfriend? How did she get there? And one of the things that was yielded from the post-mortem uh, is basically her stomach contents. Mm. We, we found in her stomach um, remnants of fish and chips. That was a clue, and that's what we need to find out. So that said, well, she must have gone to a takeaway shop mm. at Frankston, and uh, we then did all the takeaway shops. Did she go to the shop and someone followed her away mm. um, and that type of thing? So there you build, start building up your case. And then we did a massive door knock in the area. Had someone seen something? Because we've got to go to the people. A lot of people won't come and volunteer information. But as uh, as I continue on this particular uh, investigation of how important the involvement of the community is, I often say, mm-hmm. police a few, we can't do it all on our own. We need the assistance. We always do. I do what we call the stand-ups. You go up there. We, we're investigating this murder. Has anyone been in the area? Can they give us a bit of information? Crime Stoppers is there, which is a great tool. You can remain anonymous, but we need that little piece. People say, oh, I was embarrassed. Oh, look, I didn't think um, it was important. Mm. Let the investigators be the judges of that. So we're doing a door knock, and this is the furfies you then get involved in. We knocked on one particular door some days later, and a guy answered the door. He was covered in blood. And we, you know, he told us, go and get stuff and slam oh the door God. in our face. <laughs> so that you don't do that to a detective. You say, oh, <laughs> this might be something. One thing led to another. We'd take out a warrant. We get a warrant because we know we, we had no power to go in. 
Um, so we get a warrant eventually, and you've got to go through the process. You've got to do an affidavit, go to a magistrate, and swear an affidavit. It all takes time. How long does that take? Well, it just depends. During the day, it might take three, four hours. Okay. By the time you do, top up the affidavit, get us, then go to a, a magistrate's court. After hours takes maybe even longer because mm-hmm. you're calling an after hours magistrate. Mm. So it all processes because if you don't do it right at that stage, it could jeopardise your trial mm. some years later. Mm. Everything's got to be done right. So we, we take out a warrant, go back and go into this house. It's all covered in blood, but there's blood everywhere. Anyway, cut a long story short on that one. He turned out to be a self-mutilator. Oh. But we took all blood samples. Oh, we didn't, wow. Yeah, and this is the things you yeah. come across. And, you know, we wasted probably a week on him by the time we'd taken all the blood samples forensically, crime scene. We didn't know. So we take, and it wasn't far from the crime scene. Mm. So that basically, the whole door knock yielded no, no, um, no uh, evidence. So oh. if you follow the, the, the date flows, it's 11th of June 1993. Mm. So we're going about our business. Um, and then uh, on the um, 7th of July, um, we don't actually become aware of this. Uh, this is uh, something that actually Paul Denyer told us during the interview. So 11th of June 1993, he, uh, he murders Elizabeth Stevens. Um, and then uh, he does an abduction, a woman coming off the train, probably around um, 6 p.m. Uh, on the 7th of July, uh, grabs her, holds a, what he made this makeshift pistol to her head and was going to take her to a, a isolated location on foot and murder her clearly. She got away from him. Wow. Um, and, you know, she's still alive today wow. because of, of her standing up for herself. She ran away. Did that deter Denya? Now, um, then we walk in on the same day, uh, which we knew about on the 7th of July, same day, Debbie Freem, the mm. 21, 22-year-old mum, going to the milk bar to buy some uh, milk and groceries. She just had her young bubs, which she left with a friend of hers. Went to the milk bar, never seen again for some days later. She had a 12-day-old baby. Yeah. Yeah. So on that same day, he's yeah. lost one victim run away yeah. and he's just turned around that, and gone and found so much, another yeah. one. And this is the things we find out later. Wow. So if you can imagine what we're faced with as investigators, we're investigating Elizabeth Stevens. Mm. Then we get reported missing person uh, of Debbie Freem uh, from the 11th to the 7th of July. Mm. So then we start thinking, female, and we don't find the body straight away mm. until a farmer actually recalls it. Once we find the body, we start thinking we've got a serial killer on our hands. We don't want to go out there publicly and then, no. you know, f- fear into the community. And they were coming out, oh, we've got a serial killer and this type of stuff. Mm. It's so foreign to us as Australians, mm. unlike America. So we were trying to keep things down. And, and then the, the fear in the community was growing, mm. growing, growing, growing. Actually, um, the Premier actually uh, addressed the community down there because it's like bushfires. It's like a disaster. He even tried to, to quell it. So we got another team of detectives to start investigating Debbie Fre- uh, the um, Debbie Freem murder. The first breakthrough, because we found her car before we found the body. The car was found in the CBD of Frankston. So that was our first breakthrough because we knew the offender lived within walking distance of where that car was dumped. So we then worked of towards... Course, yes. Because mm. we know crooks are lazy. So we then worked... Uh, do we? Yeah, Is it, yeah. Okay. It's typical they, typical. You know, they yeah. operate in their own environment. Yeah, yeah. which will right. go into, yeah. into our criminal profiler. Mm. Wow. So we find the car... Um, and start doing examination, some blood um, on the seat, the seat's right back. Again, it's telling another crime scene. So we treat that as a crime scene. Mm. So we know the offender is very big because the seat's right back, it's wound back, there's blood on there, which we find out it's Debbie Freem's blood, um, and it's dumped there. So we know he's got to be within walking distance of this particular area. So we then start formulating a plan to door knock probably two square kilometres of every house. And this is the hard slog of being an investigator, Mm. unlike the movies. We knew he lived with him. We're going to account for every single adult individual, male or female, in every house in this square kilometre from this house. Wow. Because he had no other clues. Yeah. And then we start bringing out the community, and the community are getting a lot more uh, fearful in relation to what's happening. Everyone's looking to us. What are you blokes doing? Mm. When are you going to solve this case? And we're trying. We were working probably 18-hour days, yeah. in going back, coming home, straight away. Mm. We, work, well, we worked on the Freem case every day of the week. We didn't have a break at all. But it takes time, on. doesn't it? When you're down it to door does. knocking. It does. Yeah. It does. Because you, it's what you do at the initial investigation will then dictate the quality of the, of the trial, the quality of your evidence. 
mm. and you're doing everything right. Coppers work by the rules, crooks don't. Also, when you're door knocking, you knock on a door, a man answers the door. Yep. How long is that chat at the front door? Like, how long does it yeah. take you to ascertain whether or not this is a person you well, want to come uh, back to talk yeah, to? Yeah, well, it might take 10, 15 minutes yeah. per, per house. Uh, look, we're from Homicide Squad. We're investigating the murder of Elizabeth Stevens. Look, uh, this happened on this day. Where were you here? Where are this? Okay, who else is in this household? You're recording all of this because mm. you then have to go back to it. Now, can we have your phone numbers? Need to come? And you go on and on. And that's just one household. And we did probably a square kilometre block. Mm. And we were looking for that clue because someone might say, oh, hang on, that triggers something. I did see something. Mm. And we need to go out there. And uh, I'm no criticism on the community, but, you know, people see something and they don't think the importance of it. No, we don't. So until we go top, top, top yeah. on that door, oh, I did see a chap oddly. And then we find out later what in fact happened when we speak to Denya. So, again, the fear factor is growing in the Frankston area. Yeah. And then Debbie Freen's body's found, and we find out that she's got the same injury. She's under some bush. Surprisingly, there was little telltale signs that Debbie Stevens, um, big part, the Elizabeth Stevens, there was a, a branch broken off and put on the body. Mm. Didn't, didn't secrete her at all. And what did we get to the second crime scene? Another branch broken off and put on the body. Wow. Now, again, you then start saying, we're looking for the same killer. Mm. because why would they do it? Now, whether that was a, 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 a feeble attempt to cover the body, but it was under a bush. She had her throat cut. Again, her top was pulled up, um, and she had one stab wound to the centre of the abdomen. Uh, Elizabeth Stevens had a foot impression on her face. Oh. So we start building up this picture. This guy hates women. Mm. So you then start building up this picture in your own mind as an investigator. You say, what ifs? Look at all the possibilities. Uh, did they, the victims know that? Then we find out when we get uh, Debbie's body, well, clearly we're looking for someone that's not associated to these deceased people because Debbie Freem had no association mm -hmm. with Elizabeth Stevens, yep. different area and the likes. So you then learn as you go. So, we're, again, another team's doing that investigation as they're, they're going on. We're formulating a plan to do a massive door knock from where that car is. The car uh, doesn't yield any significant telltale identification uh, evidence for the offender. We still don't know who this guy is. Or is a girl? We don't know. Mm. Or offenders? How many? We don't know. And then um, on the uh, 30th of July, so he's gone from the 7th of July to the 30th of July, um, we get a report of a missing 17-year-old Natalie Russell. So uh, Natalie's reported missing, and it's off Sky Road between two golf courses. Um, and they're doing their search. Uniform branch are doing their search. So it's a, you know, police work goes on. It's a missing person. There's no reason to affiliate that with us. We're aware of it. But let them coppers, let the local uh, cops do their job, and we'll keep investigating the murders. Mm -hmm. The uniform police go down this laneway. They see th three holes cut in the cyclone wire fence. In one of the um, uh, entries, the second one, if you're coming off Sky Road, they find under the bushes the uh, school uniform body of Natalie Russell. Mm -hmm. And her throats have been savagely cut also. So that, when all hell breaks loose in relation to us, everyone starts saying, holy hell, you can't keep denying there's no serial killer here. Here we have a 17-year-old girl. Um, and everyone looks to us. The buck stops with us. So we're the ones who have to then give answers to the community and to the family. You know, and ultimately, we're going to do our best. And that's the hardest bit. After we do the crime scene where the body is, we sit with the deceased family for hours and hours. We've got to be mindful. Then it's a difficult position because you're sitting with deceased families virtually hours after finding the body, and you, you don't know whether you're talking to the offender mm. because there are families that kill their own in that mm. regard. So you're very guarded. Until you satisfy yourself, these people aren't involved. And often, you know, um, you're mindful of how graphic can you be or tell the family of how their loved ones lost their life. And my, my, the way I used to handle it is saying, look, I will be as honest with you as, as, as I can be. Because if I'm not at that stage and they find something else at the trial mm. months or years down the track mm. and they say, well, you didn't tell me that. Mm. Even trying to save their feelings, you know, of saying, look, she was stabbed multiple times, she was this, she was that, she was that. Why didn't you tell me that? I was saving your feelings. Well, don't. Yeah. So I then set the scene when I go to the families of these victims and say, look, I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you and I'll tell you as much as you want to know. Once I'm satisfied, they're not involved. And often I might say to the, uh, to the, um, uh, the uh, mum or the wife, look, 
or vice versa. It doesn't have to be women all the time. Mm. They're very uh, fragile in relation to emotions. Mm. Um, and they say, no, no, we want to hear it. We want to hear everything. Yeah, a lot and of dads would really struggle to hear that's right. their daughters yeah. being Because yeah. daughters and, and fathers yeah. are so close. Yeah. So uh, often you then say, okay, and you tell them, okay, she had significant uh, throat cuts and this yeah. type of stuff. Look, we're satisfied she wasn't sexually assaulted, and that relieves them. Oh, that, that's one good thing. You know, and strange as it may seem, no, you know, I get until that. you I get it. until yeah. you get involved in it yourself and become mm. a, a victim's family, yeah. you say, well, the less trauma did, and people then say, did she suffer? And and then you know, with you gain uh, some medical experience going to all the postmortems you go to, and you know that if someone stabbed or shot, the body doesn't really. It's not a pain situation okay. because it's like being punched. Not that I've ever been shot or stabbed, but it's like being punched. And you don't know the severity of it because you get stabbed, it's like someone's punched you. Or you get shot, you hear it, and then you don't know the extent of that injury. Hence why you've got to support people when they're injured Look and reassure them. It's all in the mind. Mm -hmm. So, And you can say to the family quite comfortably, look, no, your son or your daughter didn't suffer um, because they just... Uh, when you start losing blood, you go into unconsciousness and you fade away. Okay. You know, that, and so that's good to them to say, a lot of them, as long as you know, I'm, I'm, I, you put me at ease, that's all I want to hear now. I know my daughter didn't suffer and they, they'll then go and do what they need to do. We do the post-mortem. Again, um, she was finished at school and we know that was her route at home and mum was going to pick her up and things sort of went um, from bad to worse and she just started making way home. Oh. So again, the public outcry goes out there. Again, did not have an idea. So my boss came to me and said, Charlie, I want to move, whilst my team stayed on the Elizabeth Stevens case, I want you to take over the Natalie Russell case. Um, you know, resources are scarce. So I was pretty much mentally and physically exhausted from working every day and all those hours for Elizabeth Stevens. But my team continued, and I was about to take that over. So I went to the crime scene um, and started getting the uh, clues to start leading that investigation. The next day was when we were supposed to do the two-kilometre door knock from that motor, motor car. Mm. So what happened was, and this is one of these cases, this case was solved by a member of the public. A member of the public was the major, major breakthrough for us. We did not have a clue who we were looking for. He was out there somewhere. He, she, or them, or they were out there somewhere. This lady was delivering letters, and she sees a car parked in Sky Road. She sees a chap behind the steering wheel. Um, okay, he's laying back, or it was pretty low profile. Um, so she makes a phone call to the police. All it took was that, look, there's a guy in Sky Road, nothing had happened. Wow. Natalie, Natalie, just her instincts. Just her instinct because the other two murders, we had the community on high alert. Mm. We were saying, you've got to report everything. But that what that should be the norm. But complacency sets yeah. in. It's like the terrorism hotline. Mm -hmm. Complacency until something happens. We all get alerted, mm. we all go back. Mm. And that's human nature. So she made that call. Two young police officers come from Frankston. and it's, No one's in the car. They check the motor car. It's all bona fide. He comes up to Paul Charles Denier of an address. Um, that doesn't get related to us because we get so many reports of suspect motor cars. Mm. So that doesn't get related to us uh, in our intelligence gathering area. Um, and then they knock off, knock off duty. Whilst they're off duty, we find the body of Natalie Russell. Oh, okay. wow. So, which is not far from that location. Yeah. So we, we unbeknownst, we don't know the fact that this car's been checked right at the end of the laneway in Sky Road. No other reason to uh, sus suspect it. Comes up to uh, Denya. So the next day, the two uniformed guys come and see us. And they said, oh, guys, uh, we checked the car not very far from that, that particular crime scene. Only metres away, I want to say, probably 50, 80 metres away. And then we said, oh, right, it's interesting. We put two and two together. Denya, he's within our search zone. Wow. Mm -hmm. Starts leading off on there. So uh -huh. we go around. I go around, actually. We leave a, um, a no one's home. We leave a callers car, what we call a callers car. Look, did a door knock. We're investigating a, a crime. Can you please contact us? Denya contacts us. He's, got, he's living with a woman. Again, the theory of building up a picture, mm -hmm. this woman, this offender hates women. Mm-hmm. Here he's living with someone. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't put us on high alert because we know that he's living with someone. He comes in and he starts being interviewed. As he comes in, so we start up, uh, we do all our interviews on uh, videotape or DVD, uh, show my age. Mm -hmm. um, he's got injuries to his hands, got cuts to his hands. Oh, yeah. 
And we go start the interview. The interview lasts for about four hours. Mm -hmm. Denials, denials. And here's a man that's, that's smart enough. He puts himself at every crime scene. Look, we're investigating the um, uh, Elizabeth Stevens murder of uh, um, down at Cranbourne in Lloyd Park. Yeah, look, uh, yeah, I was down that way. Mm -hmm. I was going to my mum's place to get a battery for my car. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Debbie Freem. Yeah, I was in that area because I'd go to the railway station to pick up my girlfriend. I was in that area. Because if we then say, hang on, he's so distinctive, he was a very uh, obese guy. Hang on a minute, we've got you uh, uh, identified as being in this location. Well, I told you I was there. Yeah, yeah. Then we got, we've got him cleared to rights with his car being in Sky Road. Mm. What was your car there? I broke down. It overheated. It was this, where were you? I went to get water. Had an answer for everything. So you're getting all this information during the interview. So whilst we're doing the post-mortem uh, on, uh, on the body of Natalie Russell, and it, this goes to show how great our pathologists are here in Victoria, this pathologist finds a little piece of skin, probably 0 0.6 mil, a very small mm. piece of skin, but it's ridged skin. When I say ridged skin, you look at your fingerprints yeah, right. and your feet. Mm -hmm. That's the only part of your body that's got ridges mm -hmm. for fingerprints. So he finds this, this uh, piece lodged in, in her throat, I think it was. Straight away, it doesn't belong there. So we know it's not part of the skin from a throat because it's not, this, no other part of the body's reached. So he, he picks that out. And what a find. Mm. So whilst they're doing the interview, they find these injuries to his fingers. Mm. How'd you do that? I did it on a fan belt. I did this repairing a car. Had an answer for everything. Oh, God, no. Okay, and we'll account for it. So our next step is then to do a, what we call a forensic procedure. And a forensic procedure is to bring a doctor in and examine this person. Could that happen from a, a rubber fan belt, that injury? Is that a laceration? Is it an abrasion? Is that a cut? Get an interpretation on the wounds and account for him. Because here's one person, the best person we've got, and we could have eliminated him. You know, had we have gone any further and said, OK, no, we're satisfied with his story. His alibi, his wife, his partner didn't know because she works. He didn't work. So we had the run of things. Uh, had the, he could go as he pleased. So... Four hour interview, okay, we're not getting very far. He's alibied himself. I was here, I'm sort of driving around, I'm doing this. Um, we then take out a warrant for his flat. We start, uh, actually, I was, uh, I then, part of my job was then to do the warrant, search warrant at the flat. Mm. So we gather all the evidence from these different crime scenes. Um, and then we said, okay, we then have to get, we ask, I have to ask for permission from the offender to get a blood sample, DNA swab, and a medical examination. Paul, will you give us permission to conduct a forensic procedure? Sample of your hair, examination by a doctor. This is their law. Um, yes, you've got permission. He oh. gave us permission. Now, had he not given us permission, we would then have to stop proceedings. This is probably we're into one in the morning at this stage. Then do an affidavit, find a magistrate after hours, because we have to prove to magistrate that this bloke is a is a, a legitimate suspect. We're not just on a fishing expedition. Mm. And we justify the warrant. So we might do a 10, 15 page affidavit. It's very, very time consuming wow. and involved. We've, had one in the morning. we've got to do it right. Yeah. So yep. had he said no, that was our next step. Mm. That warrant, once given to us, allows us to use reasonable force to hold him down and get a, a, a doctor to examine him. I'll take a sample. Yeah. So you can say that to him. You can say you can you can yeah. not give us permission, but if you don't, we, we'll, we'll take out a warrant. Get it anyway. And once we get it off, yeah. as long as the magistrate supports us, the magistrate might say no. Mm. Uh, then we, we've got problems. Mm. But we've got to do such a significant affidavit as to why. His car's found there. He's got injuries to his hands. Um, he's, um, you know, he's got no solid alibi. He puts himself at every crime scene. Coming up, Paul Denyer makes a decision in the interview room and we'll hear actual audio of what he told detectives about the murders. Paul Denyer had been steadfastly denying any involvement in the Frankston murders for hours in the police interview room, and he was offered a short break. He had an unexpected reaction to an officer during that break that changed everything. 
he goes to the toilet because we're giving him, that's when we were allowed to smoke in police stations. And mm-hmm. we gave him a cigarette, we're giving him water, giving him refreshments, anything you need. Are you still, and you've got to be mindful that he's not overtired when he's making this stuff. You've really got to set the scene because if down the trial to say, well, my client was that exhausted, you've mm-hmm. interviewed him for 23 hours, and he's going to say anything. Is it, yeah. So you've got to be very mindful how you're doing that interview. It's all thinking about your, your, any defences are going to come up and attack you. Mm-hmm. Your mind's going a million miles an hour. You're actually in defence mode. What can they attack us? So yeah. he goes to the toilet with another detective. He looks across at this detective. He sees a crucifix around his neck. He asks him, are you a Christian? Yes, I am. I did three of them. Ooh. Bang. Wow. Problems for us. So that's admission. is not recorded anywhere. Oh. It's not anywhere. So you think in defence mode. So here you have, and you're thinking, okay, we've got to get him back to the interview room hit the camera, record on the camera, and go over that to get that admission on camera. Mm. So we get it to a stage back at the interview. This happened, that happened, that happened. So he does it in his own volition. Here's the actual audio from the interview room. Uh, You spoke to Detective O'Loughlin here, and um, you uh, told Detective O'Loughlin that you were responsible for the murders of the the three women. Is that correct? Just tell us in your own words, Paul, what happened in relation to the death of Elizabeth Stevens at Langwarren. I saw her get off the bus. I walked up behind her. Stuck my left hand around her. Ran her mouth like this and held a gun to her head right here. I started choking her with my hands and uh, she passed out after a while and then I pulled out the knife okay. and I dragged her to where she was found and I threw two branches on her body. Can you tell me why you attacked her on that night? Just, just said Just had the feeling, that's all. Where, what sort of feeling can you possibly describe it? Where, where you had this feeling? Just wanted... Just wanted to kill. Another four or five hours interview, he told us everything. I've been stalking women since I was 17. Um, on... Just to go back one step, this is something we didn't know about. So on the 11th of June, 93, is when he kills the first victim, Elizabeth Stevens. He tells us that on the 28th of February of the same year, that's when the uh, the compulsion to kill someone, he went to kill a woman that he knew in a block of flats. Again, how, how uh, the fateful, she wasn't home, he breaks into the flat, she wasn't home, he kills her cats. Oh, oh no. I remember yeah. that bit. It was yeah. very graphic, wasn't and it? And then he though? got the blood of the cats and yeah. wrote it on the bathroom wall. Sick. So, so, But we didn't know that at that stage. We didn't marry that up. And these no. are the things you learn in doing investigations. Every investigation, you always learn something. Did the yeah. lady report <laughs> what happened to her cat? Like, they did. Would that have just been, obviously, an unrelated thing? That's right. Thing, we but yeah. Have, yeah. That would have been our next like, step is to start yeah. with all How other terrifying. crimes. Yeah. Um, mm. but, but had he not told you about that you we, couldn't, we, we, didn't, we wouldn't have linked it nah and he's the one who told us about the attempted abduction because we didn't link that either yeah at that stage because everything's happened so quick so you know mm-hmm. we get the last murder on the 30th of july and then we arrest him on the 1st of august um and this is all a catalyst because of that lady making that phone call yeah so we do the second interview yeah i was um i was th- he was down there at his near his uh, relations place on an uncle auntie or wherever it was mm. And uh, I, uh, what, what, what was your feeling? Because we think about what's going through your mind. Oh, the urge was coming up. And it's, it's, it's frightening to see the interview, how he then describes himself. I was walking along and the urge was, well, what did you feel, Paul? Well, the urge was coming. Well, what urge? The, the urge to kill. Oh. He hadn't killed at this stage apart from the cats. And then I was walking along. I saw a woman get off a bus. And he said... That's how he does it that in the interview. Oh, no. That's what I'm saying. So yeah, he comes up behind random. her. He'd made a makeshift knife. 
and he held it behind her. He started walking with her. Don't do anything. I just want to talk to you. I won't hurt you. Da 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 da. Because well, she was quite innocent, as you she, said. Exactly. Very, and, very, but, you know, very she naive. Been so yeah. scared. So he walks her down to um, to the park. Interestingly, he says, "Did you pass anybody?" Yeah, I passed a couple walking the other way. It was raining at this stage. We never found that couple. Mm. But again, there's no reason. They look like Bert Goff. That's what he wanted. I want people to think we're boyfriend girlfriend yeah. or partners because she wasn't struggling she was walking along mm. he had the knife in her back goes to the park i just wanted to talk to her so we sat there talking and then he said um look uh, as we're talking i'm not going to hurt you she wanted to relieve herself mm. now she was a a uh, sprightly young girl mm. he was obese mm. naivety she walked away relieved herself and came back no Poor girl. yeah you, you just wouldn't know what you would do in no, that situation. No. You know, one person might fight back, the other might be like, right, if I do everything this person says, that's right. I might yeah. be okay. That's right. Assuring yeah, that's, that's right. That's but that's the, that's the thing what goes, people say, oh, if someone pull a gun on me, I'll do this. Yeah, you Spare don't know, me. do you? That, yeah. Exactly. So, unfortunately, she accepted everything you told her. I'm not going to hurt you, I just want to talk to you. Now, whether she felt some sympathy for him, we'll never know. The fact is, wow. when you look at the interview and you look at him, you say, people say to me, well, what's a killer look like? Well, look in the mirror. I wouldn't think a killer looked like him. That's right. Yeah, that's right. No, so you look at him. Just like a so slobby kind he, of. Exactly. He yeah, came back, uh, ends up killing her, doing what he did. Everything fits in. And then, he, and then you know, you've got to be careful that someone's not making false admissions. Mm-hmm. So he told us about breaking a branch off. Well, no one knew that. We don't publicise oh, yeah. that. This is the guy. Did what he about, say why? No. It didn't have any sense. It was more like a covering up, but just the last thing to cover her up, basically. There was no other, no other reason, but it didn't serve any purpose. Mm. What about, what else did you do? Oh, cut us front. What else did you do? Oh, I had a little pocket knife and I cut her torso. No one knew that. So we know we're talking to the right person. Mm. Why'd you do that? I don't know. I just want to see what it felt like. You know, and just there playing with it and this stuff. Um, then what did you do? Okay, he went home. His, his partner's oblivious to all of this. Just goes on his normal life. So then he's picking up his girlfriend again. He misses a train or something or other. That's the reason he gives us. He's at the Seaford Railway Station attempts to abduct this uh, next woman she gets away with him and in the interview he becomes very upset that he told her don't move I'm not going to hurt you I'm not going to hurt you and uh, he said oh she went against her word mm. I said you're gagging aren't you so he was upset that she went against her word to save her life so she ran away eventually reported to the police did that deter him no it didn't keeps on walking sees a car pull up the, at the milk bar Debbie Freem comes up there Opens the back door. I'm sitting in the back. I'm sort of looking up, watching what uh, what the driver's doing. I crouch down. She hops in the driver's seat. I hold a knife to her neck. <gasps> Don't drive. Poor old Debbie is absolutely shocked. Tries a U-turn. Crashes into the um, milk bar. Reverses. Directs her to this pa- part of uh, back uh, near the farmlands of out of Frankston, and um, and uh, kills her there again. She and he tells us she put up a hell of a fight, Charlie. Put up a hell of a fight. And, uh, you know, she was a bigger woman than, uh, than Nat Elizabeth was. And then he kills her, um, takes the cops in the car, uh, pulls, her under, t- pulls her under some bushes. A farmer eventually finds her, drives the car back to his location. And then he goes back inexplicably the next day. Why would you go back to the car? Oh, I was interested because he had a purse in there. I was interested to see who I killed. Oh, so he wow. goes back, he takes the milk that she bought, other stuff. He takes them home, gets rid of that stuff at home. and Weird stuff. Mm. Um, I wanted then, to what, see her ID, see her yeah, name. I just, her... I just want to know who, who she was. Wow. So, again, life goes on. And, again, what, what were you feeling with, when you saw this car? Oh, the urge was just coming up. I just wanted to kill. Uh, I've had the urge to kill since I was 15. I've been stalking women since I was 17. And we're going, holy hell, he wasn't on our radar at all. I mm. don't believe he had any prior convictions. So um, the interview then continues. Okay, Natalie Russell. He'd been to a park earlier... It was all full of school kids looking for a next victim. Mm. This is uh, some uh, days later. It was too busy, so he parks in Sky Road. Parking in Sky Road, he, see, he, he prepares the, the two lane way. He goes there with a pair of pliers, cuts two layers in the first one, some metres down, another one, a few more metres down, a third one. And his plan was to hide in one, see someone walk past, jump out, and this is what he did. He parks the car, sees Natalie Russell, and he knows she's going to head for that location because of the, the, the um, uh, geography of the, of the location. He knew it's because it's, quietly, it's heavily used. It's amazing. This is 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Mm. So he goes ahead of her, hides in the first lair. Mm. She, 
sees Natalie walk past in school uniform. He comes up behind her until she gets level with the second layer, grabs her, pulls her into it. Mm. Again, this is actual audio of Denya reenacting Natalie's murder for police. I uh, went up there earlier that day and cut the holes in the fences. What um, did you use to cut the holes in the fences? Pair of pliers. I um, stood here and watched Natalie Russell walk around the corner. And then I went through this hole and waited behind the trees there right. until I saw her walk past here and heading that way. Right. And when she got about 10 metres down the track here, I came out of the fence. As we're walking along here, mm. are you still maintaining that distance behind her? No, I was getting closer each time. I walked along the grass like this and make a sound. So you would be heard? Yeah. We've decided not to include Charlie's description of Natalie's attack, but there is one important detail you need to know. In tampering with her body as she died, Denya left a tiny piece of skin from his finger in Natalie's throat. So he does that, kills her. As he's walking out of the laneway, he sees the two police officers at his car. He says, my hands were so bloody to put him in my pocket. That's how cool he was. And walk past the police. Wait a few minutes ago, hops back in the car, goes home, washes himself up, keeps the weapons, all this type of stuff. So drives home like nobody's business. We find the report by the police the next day. One thing leads to another, we arrest him and go from there. So ultimately, he makes these admissions, but you're still not out of the woods. As an investigator, you know or you believe as a potential that he might have come up to the trial instead of getting charged with three murders. We've got him dead to right for Natalie Russell because of the skin. Mm. Nexus, a link, we can put him at that crime scene. Mm. We can't put him at the other two crime scenes, mm. even though he puts himself in the area. For all we knew, he was going to come up to a trial and say, oh, I killed Natalie, you've got me there, but I didn't kill the other two, it was a copycat. You know, uh, I, uh, I knew about those, I don't know who did that, but I killed Natalie because I, I read about this and I just wanted to see what it was like. But I didn't do those two. We didn't have enough... Um, circumstantial evidence or what we call similar fact evidence. We had similar fact evidence to a degree about the wounds to the ladies' necks. That was similar fact. But is it that significant that a jury would say, yep, how could we negate that it wasn't a copycat murder that he did? Mm. But he admitted the whole lot. Then he did a full reenactment, which was great, and his recall was phenomenal. When he, in one of the purses that he stole, I don't know with, uh, whether it was um, uh, Debbie's, he, they went straight to the spot, he kicked around the, and he found it. Okay, can you sh- tell us what happened here? Well, the car was sitting over there. This is uh, Debbie Freem's car we're talking about. Yeah, Pulsar. <clears throat> right. I was walking down this road here. Right. Uh, saw it jump out of the car. Yes. Ran into the milk bar here. So I jumped in the back seat of the car. Right. And the car was directly across the road, so I could see it from inside the car in there. Did you get the sense that he was enjoying the reenactments? Oh uh, yeah, he was enjoying the interview because yeah. uh, he'd sit there and he was smiling and, well, what's the matter, uh, Paul? Oh, I'll just uh, have you know the camera and this and that and you know and it was a novelty for him. I would think to go into detail at a reenactment, you'd have to be enjoying it on yeah, some level. Yeah, yeah. But again, it just removed it. We really was putting every nail in that coffin to say, this guy's not going to beat us. Mm-hmm. We need everything, and no, the only person that would know all this is the offender. So we did all that. Okay, we go to trial. So we we did the arrest on the 1st of August, uh, charged with three counts of murder and one count of kidnapping of uh, the lady he tried to abduct. Um, So on the 15th of December, it's one of the quicker ones. Normally it doesn't come up this quick, but Supreme Court, 15th of December 1993. He pleaded guilty and got life imprisonment, no parole. Then kicks in the justice system. Now, precedent then dictates that if a person pleads guilty, they must get a minimum set. But this brave judge, I think it was Judge uh, uh, Frank Vincent, fantastic, strong judge, and the severity, the the absolutely uh, um, uh, significance of these three murders of three innocent women that he stalked and murdered and and did what he did, this judge said, no, you're getting life, no parole. I don't care if you've pleaded uh, guilty. You're not going to get a discount from me. No. But I think he would have known back of his head, I'm going to get appealed against, mm. because it gives him rights of appeal. Sure enough, uh, an appeal was lodged on New Year's Eve, 31st of December 1993, based on the fact that the penalty was manifestly excessive, 
What, for killing three women? Yeah. yeah. And also the minimum parole period should have been set. Why? Because he pleaded guilty. Mm. Precedent dictates that. So the appeal was then heard. He stays in custody. The appeal was heard in 19, July, uh, the, the following year, 1994. And as uh, the full Supreme Court bench of three judges then said, well, OK, life imprisonment or three life imprisonments, uh, but you're going to get minimum of 30 years before you're eligible for parole. Ten years of life. Mm-hmm. Pretty cheap. Yeah. So he's 21 when he's locked up. Mm. He was eligible for parole uh, in uh, 2023. He's going to be 51. That's not far away. No, it's not. 2018 next year, that's when we need the government to intercede, as they have in the past, to say, no, we'll legislate, you'll never be released. Mm. And the same with him, because when the psychologist, psychiatrist interviewed him, A, he, he wasn't mentally impaired, he knew the right from wrong, he just wanted to kill, knowing what he was doing, uh, and we had to prove all that. Um, so therefore, he'll always kill. Mm. So there's no way no, and this guy uh, should be getting parole. But that's something for future. Well, his argument will probably hinge on the fact that he is very controversial for another reason. Yep. Since going to jail, he has uh, decided to transition, to make a gender transition. Mm-hmm. He said that he has gender dysphoria. So initially in the interview, he said, um, when, it, when asked, why did I kill, why did you kill women? He said, I hate them. I just hate them all. Correct. None in particular. I just hate them in general. Yep. Now he says, no, it's that I want to be a woman. Yep. That I've never hated women. I just wanted to be a woman. And, and so he now calls himself Paula Denya yeah. and um, wants to have gender reassignment surgery that's right. in uh, prison and paid for by the government. And that's correct. an ongoing... They won't do that, though. We'll no, legal the go- the, no, no, they won't. But he was uh, getting uh, makeup smuggled in, mm. uh, had his hair on a pony and... Uh, he wouldn't address anyone that didn't call him Pauline and things like that. Mm. And in actual fact, you know, that he supported to a degree because he was living with a woman. Mm-hmm. So, but that he did, that he wasn't misogynist because right. he was living with. Yeah, the woman, exactly. Right? So, but you say now you say that now it's all self-serving. Yes. But the whole overriding issue is the justice system is there to protect the community at mm-hmm. large. You're one individual. Have you been rehabilitated? You know, it's a big uh, daunting thing on the parole board to say, yep, we'll let you out on licence back in the community on parole. The way the parole boards in the past, you know, we, we, all, we understand all of that. Mm. They are more acutely aware of these decisions they're making. Yeah. To me, I can't see him being released, but that's for another decision to be made by by the current, uh, the, the, um, the political party who would be in power then and plus the judges. So, you know, we finished that investigation. We were all physically, mentally exhausted. Mm. We, um, we left there, went to a pub at 7 in the morning, had a, one beer and got, went home and collapsed, basically, from oh, exhaustion. But that's what you work for. The Jenya case was one of the, the only case that I rang um, Natalie Russell's um, family mm. because they're very mindful about opening up wounds yeah. and this type of thing. And when you say with different families... Um, the purpose of that was I didn't want him reading it in my autobiography and then being, you know, shell-shocked again. So I rang the mother up and she knew who I was. And I said, look, the reason I, I, I want to do it, I want to then highlight to the community what this mongrel did to your lovely daughter. Mm. And because I never got that opportunity to do that because he pleaded guilty, mm. her response was, go for it, Charlie. I want you to tell all and sundry who are prepared to buy your book mm-hmm. and know what this... this bad language here, but what this guy did to my lovely daughter. Mm. Charlie Bazina's autobiography, Fighting Crime from the Frontline, is excellent and it's available now. You can also buy our very own Emily Webb's Australian True Crime books on our Facebook page. That's Australian True Crime on Facebook. Just hit the Shop Now button. This episode features audio from the Forensic Investigators Program from Channel 7. Thank you so much for downloading Australian True Crime and thank you to everybody who's given us great reviews and five stars on iTunes.